Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's been a while to Tuesdays with Leroy here at Ball Nine. I am your host, Chris Vitale, and I'm very, very, very pleased to have two wonderful guests with me today. Um, unless you've been living under a rock for the last few years, you know the work of this artist, Greg Kreindler. Uh, he looked at him, he's smiling, how happy he is. Um, some you can see some of his work behind him, you can see it anywhere else. I mean, if you can't you can't escape it, it's fantastic. Greg, how are you today? I'm great, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well. Might have had a little too much coffee, but uh, I'm in good shape. You know, in good shape. Also <laughs> joining, I know it does. Also joining us, uh, kind of the man behind the curtain with this project, if you will. Uh, one of the biggest baseball fans you'll ever meet. A huge collector, and uh, it's some great stories that that I know he has to share. Jay Caldwell is with us. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys coming in. Um, hope you guys have been having a great morning, afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, now, I would like to just start off by saying that these gentlemen are putting out a book called Black Baseball in Living Color, which from what I've seen and read, I cannot wait to get my hands on a copy. It's just gorgeous. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, it'll make a wonderful holiday gift. It's coming out this month, so make sure. Put it on the list. Um, so I, before we get into the book you know, really heavily here, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how you guys met and this project came up. Um, I know there was an exhibit at the Negro League Museum. Um, so I just wanted to talk about that a little bit before we get into it. Um, Jay, I'll let you start with that. Okay. Well, um, back around 2000, I guess it was 14 or 15, I had the idea of uh, doing something for the centennial of the founding of the Negro Leagues. And I believe it was 2015, a uh, mutual artist friend of ours, uh, Monty Sheldon, introduced us at the National Sports Collectors Convention. And I told Greg what my idea was about putting together an art and artifact exhibition for the centennial. Uh, Greg was all in. One of the things I quickly learned about Craig is that although he does uh, a lot of Yankees, he lives in uh, New York, he you know, you know, big Yankee fan, as his name is evidence of. Um, he likes doing people that he hasn't done before. And I had a whole laundry list of people he hadn't done before. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was, you know, jumped in with all three feet. That's why you only see him from the head up. You know? It's true. Um, but we'll get into um, that later. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, we over the next four years, uh, we selected players. Uh, Craig found photos. Um, he's very meticulous about finding photos that he could really work with and have a good detail. Um, and what started off is, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, players ended up expanding to uh, 240 portraits. And yeah, that's... When, in February 2020, we put on the exhibit. That's great. Now, you know, Greg, um, you know, I mean, once it grew exponentially to 230 portraits, um, how much time did it take to actually to finish all of these? I mean, I know you're pretty quick in your work, but I mean, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of uh, a lot of paintings. It was a lot of research. It was a lot of, you know, back and forth between Jay and I and also back and forth between other, uh, you know, historians and, and people who are kind of helping out with the project. Uh, I, I think on average, in terms of hours, it was probably taking somewhere between maybe like six and eight hours per portrait, maybe a little bit more. But, you know, over the course of those of those few years, uh, you know, the uh, the exhibition at the museum opened up uh, February 13th. And I think I mailed Jay maybe the last couple of portraits January 15th or something like that. So oh, okay. it was kind of like right down to the wire and that's just, that's consistently working yeah. and, you know, trying to get done other commissions that people had been waiting for. So uh, it was a long time and it was a lot of energy and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it was great. But, you know, then I also had to see Sweet. Jay and talk with oh. Jay. And <laughs> There's drawbacks to every job. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly, exactly. But I but, mean, you know, the, uh, the thing I remember about that is, um, both Greg and I uh, uh, attended an opening of the exhibit, and I ended up bringing the last few portraits with me. <laughs> they weren't shipped. <laughs> really? 
Yeah. Oh my lord, that's that's okay. That's pretty funny. Now, um, now, I mean, I know you guys worked with Bob Kendrick with the museum. Um, what did the living players think about this exhibit? I mean, like to see them as young men, and you know, I mean, what, what I'm just curious as to. You know, if you guys have any good stories about the living Negro League players that attended this exhibit and what they had to say about this. And because I mean, I would assume that's, you know, that's got to be it's like looking in the mirror and coming back and seeing a much younger man, you know, so. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there aren't very many of them at no, the time of the exhibit. Um, I think the only two players that were still living were. Um, Willie Mays and oh, wow. uh, Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron at the time, right? And uh, Hank Aaron, um, I was able to communicate through his agent. I never spoke with him directly, and he yeah. was very pleased with the portrait and the Excellent. effort that was being done. Um, unfortunately, I was never able to reach Willie Mays, so uh, don't know what he thought of it, if anything. Well, that's fair. That's fair. And um, so I guess now this, which I keep on my desk at all times, is the oh yeah. yeah is the collecting card set, which also makes a great stocking stuffer. So get that too. Um, see, see? But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So now that was, that, that, that came out about how long after the exhibit, those cards? That came out in May of 2020. Okay. So, you know, we launched the exhibit and it shut down within a month because of COVID. And so this right. exhibit that was, you know, supposed to honor the centennial and was supposed to basically last all year, ended up having a run of a month or something. Um, yeah. And then it got me since, you know, I was housebound, like, you know, the whole nation just about um, got me to thinking of what could we do to kind of, you know, continue what the mission of trying to celebrate the centennial. And we came up with the card set. And fortunately, uh, uh, that hit at the time when everybody was locked down and card collecting really took off again. Yeah. And um, also came at a time um, just before um, Major League Baseball recognized the uh, seven Negro Leagues as uh, Major Leagues, which also provided a free uh, boost of publicity for the card set. Sure, sure. <laughs> But no, that's true. I mean, the card collecting, the hobby kind of went through the roof during COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I was buying all kinds of weird things that I probably shouldn't have, but <laughs> what else was I going to do? I mean, I was stuck in yeah, a garage yeah. in California. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I regret it, but you know. Well, that Chris, that was how you and I hooked up uh, eventually. Yeah. So you can, you can blame the pandemic on that. You yeah. Know. Well, I mean, that's I how you know. Blame, yeah, no, that's true. And I can blame the entire pandemic on, on, I mean, I can blame ball nine on the entire pandemic because I mean, I started this thing out of kind of just boredom. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of us did those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. You that's know? Right. Like, why yeah. not? But uh, so, I mean, when did you guys, Greg, when did you guys kind of want to transition this? When did you guys come up with an idea like, wow, man, this would make a great book. Um, you know, was that, I mean, because this had to be a project that, you know, is a long time in the making, right? Yeah. I mean, Jay, Jay and I had kind of, I feel like even in the beginning, we had kind of talked about these different ways to, uh, it wasn't so much about marketing the show so much as it was kind of providing resources for people who were interested uh, in the Negro and Latin American leagues. So, you know, we had the ideas for, for the card set, for, you know, for books, for, uh, for, you know, bobbleheads that eventually came out. Uh, Jay had been working uh, on, you know, some possible curriculum for schools to, to teach that uh, really? to teach Negro league stuff in their classrooms. Yeah, it was, it was pretty involved, but I think it was only maybe about, a, no, it was less than a year ago. It was kind of like maybe six months ago that I think, uh, you know, it was actually able to start uh, coming to fruition with, wow. with this particular book. Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's actually pretty quickly. I mean, that's I mean that's yeah. a tall order. And that's a quite a bit of work. Now, before we get on, Jay, I want to know a little more about this curriculum that that you were talking about. I, th that's really interesting to me. Well, it's it's um, I think like many people you feel like you have uh, some great ideas for books and ideas. And then, you know, translating that into a real product is always the hard part. 
<laughs> yeah. The ideas are easy. Yeah. The hard part is uh, Execution. putting it on paper. Yeah. Um, so I've had that idea for a long time with um, getting this through this book, um, which really started about June of this year. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, <laughs> It's amazing. We wow. also um, connected through uh, a mutual friend named Dave Kaplan, who used to uh, head up the Yogi Berra Museum. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he now is uh, involved with uh, the reconstruction of Hinchliffe Stadium in um, New Jersey. Yeah. And he contacted us and asked if we'd be interested in helping out in some aspects, since they put a museum there to educate people about the Negro Leagues. And um, we both said yes. Of course. Um, and so that kind of provided the impetus of taking some of these ideas about school curriculum and putting them on paper. And I don't know that I want to discuss it in too much detail. No, of course not. Of course fear not. Of, uh, having somebody steal the idea, but I, I am working on something <laughs> associated with that that I hope when uh, children come to the museum, uh, they will find some educational products uh, that will uh, help education um, and teach them about the uh, Negro Leagues. That's fantastic. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. And that's kind of what I like about doing things like this. I mean, it's just, just I mean, it's our tagline is know what you don't know. So, I mm -hmm. mean, things like that. I mean, there's always, there's so much history and there's just so much that has happened in the last 150 years plus mm -hmm. in the game of baseball that there's always something that you can learn. And I think something like that. And I think for the next generation of kids, they should learn that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it just, there's a rich, rich history there. And this, this is, that's why I love what you guys are doing. I mean, it really mm -hmm. is a, it's a stunning piece of art, but it's also a learning tool. And that mm -hmm. to me is fantastic. Now, speaking of this learning tool and beautiful piece of art, let's get into the book a little bit, shall we? <laughs> um, again, now Black Baseball in Living Color uh, will be released this month. Um, now, Greg, you're obviously the artist. Um, Jay, you know, you're, you're one, one, of the, one of the many great authors in this. I mean, you have some great heavy hitters, guys from Sabre. I mean, you know, I, I, I said Todd Radham is one of the designers. How did you put this team together um, to, to just get together in such a short period of time now that you mentioned it started in June? Yeah. Well, it really started with um, uh, Sabre and Bill Nolan, who's uh, one of the directors of Sabre, yep. who was uh, in charge of a project, uh, a Sabre project, putting together a book on the 1920 uh, Chicago American Giants. Oh, wow. And he contacted me and asked if uh, he could use some of uh, Craig's paintings uh, to illustrate that book. And we agreed. And that along with um, actually some work I did with the Yes Network, um, doing some short uh, videos that were displayed in uh, Yankee pregame shows, got me going, okay, well, maybe I'll, I should start actually putting pen to paper and start writing this book. And so through, um, uh, through Bill, um, he put to help me put together a team of writers that were interested in writing the various chapters. And Craig put me in co contact with Todd Radom, who uh, uh, did the uh, cover design. And yeah, everybody, uh, again, just jumped in and said, yeah, this is a great idea. Love the, love the project. So uh, the other people I should mention is... Uh, Man Cave Pictures. Uh, we've got uh, you know 240 of uh, Craig's paintings. We've got I think it's 16 team photos from uh, Man Cave Pictures, colorized photos, and then we have a number of uh, artifact photos as well. That's outstanding. Now I mean, it's now Craig. How much input did you have? I mean, I mean, did, I mean you guys pretty much just used everything, right? Everything from that exhibit and then some. Right. Well, I mean, there was some stuff. There were some artifacts that Jay had in his, you know, his personal collection, which uh, I don't think made it into the books. Right, Jay, the, the stuff that the uh, ended up being acquired yeah, by the yeah. museum. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it it was. It, it's funny. It's an exhaustive amount of stuff of of you know, artifacts of imagery of stories yeah. and still at the same time, you know, I feel like we've kind of only scratched the surface, which is, 
you know, kind of crazy to say, but, uh, I, you know, Jay, uh, Jay and I kind of joke that, uh, you know, that if the show had not opened up, you know, in February of 2000 uh, or 2020, then, uh, you know, he just would have had me keep doing portraits, I think, until, <laughs> until, I'd, done it, until I'd done everybody. I mean, it, that was like the deadline and yeah, it, it's just a lot there. Uh, Nothing like a deadline to focus your attention. It's very oh. true. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you are not kidding. But I mean, that, well, I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, one thing I did notice is, you know, in, in some of the profiles sections, I, I mean, I, but I, I also saw, you know, F.A. Manley, Joe Lewis, which I thought were <clears throat> was very cool as well. And, and you almost had like a player card segment on each of them, right. which I thought was great. How did you guys come up with that idea? I think that was all Jay. Yeah, that was, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to some extent, kind of duplicate the card set, although there's many more portraits um, in the book than there were in the card set. And, but I wanted it to see the picture and then uh, understand who the player was or who the personage was. Yeah. And so the idea was, you know, you can't just flip it over like you can a card, but if you have the images on the left-hand side of the, the portraits on the left, an explanation of who they are on the right, that kind of does the same thing. Yeah. And so uh, that was the concept behind it. No, I, I think that's fantastic. And it, it's almost like kind of like an homage to like, you know, when you would keep cards in those little binders and you would flip it over and exactly. it's kind of yeah. that, that feel to it, which I thought was really, really cool. And, you know, I mean, but it covers so much ground, the book. I mean, you know, even the, you know, I'm looking at it now, the, you know, the black baseball in the 19th century, you're going way back with that, mm -hmm. with that chapter. Right. So, well, Jay know, was it, there. He, he witnessed it in person. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I still have Adler's double day's ball here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's, it, it really is exhausting. And I mean, so how much research did you guys have to do to really tie this whole thing together? Because I mean, they're, they're you know, from what I've read and, and it's all fantastic, but it's, it's in depth, man. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. It's well, I'll speak for myself. Um, you know, the other artists involved did their own, or not artists, authors involved did their own uh, uh, research. And um, <clears throat> I think we ended up, I, I'd have to look, but we have like eight pages of end notes um so it's very heavily uh referenced um myself i had been doing research for years and just had a lot of you know bits and pieces strewn across multiple platforms honestly trying to you know someday i'll come up with a unifying concept and but then i also really dug into uh various new newspaper archives to find some uh you know just some great quotes and some great stories and tried to weave it all in. And for me, part of this is not just talking about baseball, but talking about what was going on in the country as a whole, yeah. including in some instances, just things that as I was doing the research, just really st struck me as a, um, wow. You know, now, I'll give you one example. I, I wrote the chapter on what's uh, it's called Surviving the Great Depression. Yes, I, I read that. It's great. And um, the uh, stock market, when it crashed in uh, October of 1929, I don't have it right in front of me. Maybe I should have memorized this. Was you know the NS, the New York Stock Exchange Index was something like uh, 391 or something. Yeah. It didn't get to that level again until 1954. Ooh. So by 1954. The Negro Leagues were, you know, basically gone. Yeah. The, uh, you know, World War II had come and gone. Uh, we're into the Eisenhower administration. You know, that was, you know, um, you know, 25 years basically of, uh, you know, economic depression and, you know, slow recovery. That, that was an amazing statistic to me. No, absolutely. And actually, because I do have it in front of me because I'm a nerd, uh, yes, it did not reach that level again until November 23rd, 1954. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> in your words, Jay, that's in your words. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, well, but there are things know. like that that just, you know, um, I try to tie it into what's going on in the country. And 
you know, the depression was just um, an amazing economic devastation. Yeah. And then it was quickly followed, as I say in that chapter, by the Dust Bowl. Yes. And um, it was just, you know, well, if we don't knock you out with the left fist, we're going to try with the right <laughs> fist. Here <laughs> comes the uppercut, you know. Just yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> But now, so, so Greg, I mean, going back to, you know, your process, I know, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot about it because you and I have spoken about it and I've read a ton about it, but if there are, like I said, some people that have been under a rock and have not seen it or don't know exactly what your process is, I mean, you're working off of old, you know, black and white or sepia tone photos and you have to find, you know, I mean, the colors just of everything and I, the way the sunlight hits them and everything. It's, I was just wondering if you could describe that for these people that just came out from under the rocks. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, yeah, like, like you had mentioned, I, I kind of would start out with, uh, with reference material that was black and white or, or sepia toned and, you know, usually coming from uh, old photos that have survived or, or or newspapers or guidebooks or things like that. And normally what I would do for, for really anything that I, that I create, I just try to, I try to breathe life back into the image by kind of uh, not so much colorizing it, but just kind of, you know, paying attention to things like the time of day and, and, and the kind of weather that, uh, that these particular images were, were taken in. And I try to put the viewer back in that same day that they're kind of like, they're the cameraman uh, or camera woman looking at that player. And that's what they see. Yeah. Uh, with the Negro Leaguers, it was, it was extra hard. Uh, you know, one, it's just starting off. One of the great things about, uh, about having Jay, you know, as a partner for all of this is because when he handed me this list, this ever growing list, yeah. I probably had heard of, I don't know, maybe 15 of these Negro leakers, like, and, and knew a little about them. If I'm, if I'm being generous, uh, you know, maybe 95% never heard of them. And Jay, I feel like I'd, I'd contact him or, or we talk on the phone or whatever. And, he would mention a player and I'd be like, okay, I've never heard of, of him or her, you know, what, what's, what's their deal. And Jay, you know, just like he had done a couple minutes back, he breaks it down in a very digestible way. Uh, and, you know, points out the interesting stories. He's not talking about stats. I mean, stats are important, but uh, the way that, that Jay tells a story helps and kind of inspires me uh, not only to, uh, to work on these, but, you know, to obviously be as, uh, historically accurate as I can be. Uh, but yeah, when, when, I'm, when you're talking about like the, uh, the jerseys and the ballparks and things like that, a lot of times, you know, a lot of that information has kind of been lost to time. Uh, yeah. You know, we have, we had Mark Okunin who, who did that, you know, great book and the, and the hall of fame project uh, with, uh, Tom Schieber with the uh, with the major league uniforms from 1900 until current times, and uh, Craig Brown goes back even further uh, into the 19th century, but for the most part, it's all the white leagues. Uh, there just isn't there just isn't much information about what these uniforms looked like uh, in in color in, in real life. Uh, you know, there, there are some surviving examples here and there, which you can kind of use as a, as a jumping off point, but uh, it, you know, required a lot of digging, uh, you know, looking for kind of little, little throwaway nuggets that, that writers might toss your way or, you know, talking to another artist who has dealt with the subject matter before and, and knew these Negro leaguers personally and, you know, had asked about this kind of stuff. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this whole like process, it's, you know, it's, it's a labor of love. Uh, of so, you know, you get, you get deep into the trenches with it and, you know, one moment you obviously want to pull your hair out, but uh, in the end, you kind of feel like you're hopefully doing these, uh, these men and women justice. Well, that's, I mean, you, I mean, you kind of answered what was going to be my next question is how much of this information actually survived um, that you were able to use. I mean, that had to be, I mean, are you going to the library looking at microfiche at this point? Like, I, well, that's the problem. I mean, Jay Jay can probably speak to this uh, uh, as well. But you know, the the 
uh, traditionally black newspapers were not, you know, coming out every day like uh, like your white newspapers. Like the New York Times or something. Yeah, like New York exactly. Times. Exactly. And if they were covering uh, if they were covering baseball, if they were covering the Negro Leagues, I you know, there weren't really the kind of writers who were talking about uniform colors and you know what stadiums look like yeah. you know these are kind of like short ball game descriptions if that maybe just stats and you're getting it week by week not day by day uh so yeah i it's just a lot of that information isn't there so a lot of it has to be kind of an educated guess whether you know the monarchs traditionally it's like we we have an, a surviving example of like a 1936 uh road Kansas City Monarchs jersey, which, you know, had uh, trim colors of, of navy and red. And so I'm like, okay, so maybe that's a color scheme that they kind of used often. So you kind of take something like that and you you make educated guesses about what came before it and, and what came after it. And you kind of hope that you can connect the dots here and there with, uh, you know, with actual discoveries in your research. No, that's, that's let me, actually, let me, yeah. Please, I was going to ask you the same question. Absolutely. What Greg was talking about, you know, basically the mainstream white newspapers didn't cover the Negro Leagues, except, except for, you know, special occasions. Um, the black newspapers uh, were hometown newspapers. They generally were published once a week. They didn't have a budget to send reporters on the road with the teams and report back. And this is why a lot of statistics are missing. Um, and, um, you would typically, the papers, uh, would come out, um, and you would, uh, you know, get maybe the weekend games and that was about it. Um, so it was very hard to, you know, find detailed descriptions of, uh, the players' lives, the, uh, what the uniforms looked like. There just weren't yeah. newspaper inches to cover all that. So, um, it is a, a real research project. And um, beginning in, I believe, the 1970s uh, with uh, John Holloway and other authors who started talking to surviving Negro Leagues players, there's some oral history. And I, I would guess that oral history is 90, you know, 85, 90 percent accurate, like everybody's memory. You it's know, baseball. It's, so, perfect. it's <laughs> baseball, though. Yeah, it's... But um, uh, at least it provided a basis and um, uh, people took notes, wrote that down, and that's you know as much of, of a history as uh, the a lot of the black newspapers. I mean, there just aren't a lot of details. Yeah, I mean, and, and, I'm sorry, go ahead, Greg. Oh no, no. Oh, well, I was going to say, you know, luckily, you know, we also have uh, a lot of historians, uh, visual historians, who were very helpful. You know, people like Phil Dixon and, and Larry sure. Lester, who were you know, who were instrumental in, in kind of bringing this whole thing uh, to light. And, you know, I, you know, even just to talk about, uh, Jay, what he was saying about the newspapers and, and, and photography that, you know, if there were uh, people who were photographing these Negro League games, you know, obviously a lot of that photography did not necessarily survive. Uh, even though baseball, you know, is like the most visually documented sport in history, there's still that hole. And then, you know, if you're talking about Latin American uh, league stuff, then that stuff doesn't really survive. And you're dealing with weather that is not conducive to keeping uh, paper in good condition. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's just all sorts of things that are kind of working against you. Uh, but I think we were able to, to at least, you know, create a body of work that, uh, that I think, you know, that I feel proud of. And I, I think Jay feels proud of it too. Uh, and I think it's kind of a step forward for that well, stuff. Absolutely. And actually, that's the second time. Thank you, Greg, that you took the question out of my mouth. But <laughs> I'm gonna what, what the hell am I even doing here at this point? Sorry. I'll just sit here and have my water and I'll let you guys do. <laughs> no, I actually I actually did want to ask about you know about the you know the Latin American teams and you know, like you know, Havana and just you know, all these other teams that you guys did include. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had to be, you know, that, I mean had to be exhausting trying to research some of those things, but since you already answered it, I guess. Yeah, I that, Jay, Jay, you talk. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'll let Jay go with that one. He's been nice. He hasn't, he's, how did you get a list of my questions? <laughs> yeah. I feel like you must've sent out a, uh, uh, a, uh, 
a menu of things that we were supposed to talk about. Maybe I, didn't I did it. it in my sleep. I don't know. I, just, you know it's, I got up to make a sandwich, and I guess I just emailed Greg. Here you go. You go. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> But Jay, well, Greg goes, did a great yeah. job on researching the Negro, uh, the the Latin American leagues, and we yeah. we do have a chapter on the Latin winter leagues, which oh, wow. we, we uh, you know uh, seg right. segregated right. from say yeah. Mexico, which was a summer league. Yeah. Um, but um, you know the the Cuban league is very well documented. Sure. The 1937 season in the Dominican Republic uh, is well documented. Um, but a lot of the others, like Venezuela and Panama, were I, we really struggled. I really struggled I trying I to find information about them. And um, uh, you know, this is not this book is meant to be um, what do I say readable by the general public. It's sure. not an academic journal, right. um, which is good because if the word has more than three symbol, symbols or <laughs> syllables in it, I, I have trouble. <laughs> or, um, Give yourself more this evidence right now. Um, but the um, we, we hope it's readable. We, we think it's accurate, and um, it at least exposes people to a wide variety. That if they want to go more in depth in any one thing, uh, it gives them some guidelines. If nothing else, through the end notes, saying here's where all the research material is. Yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, like I said, I mean, it's everything I've read, I mean, it, it is, it's enjoyable. Even the non-baseball fan can find it interesting. Anyone who's just interested in a little bit of history or, mm -hmm. or you know, or just, just, you know, just the art. I mean, they, there's a little something for everybody in there, which I think is fantastic. Um, now, this might be a, a weird question and it might be asking you guys kind of like what's your favorite toe that you have, but do you guys have any personal favorite portraits in the book? Just personally favorites to you. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the toe part, Greg. I'm just asking. <laughs> Were there any that really stuck out to you that that meant a little more? <laughs> I was expecting a favorite child, not favorite toe. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has toes. So I, I, I figured that way, you know, it's a little more relatable. Fair, fair. Sorry. <laughs> well, Greg, you gotcha. go first on this one. That's what okay, you get for uh, answering the questions before I ask. Okay. Uh, well, there, there are a few that I keep coming back to. Uh, and and you you mean just specifically portraits or subjects? I mean, I mean in relation to the book. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean let's go in relation to the book because I know there are a couple um, a couple major leaguers that you love to paint. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but um, yeah, let's. I I really found I really fell in love with a lot of players, uh, a lot of Negro leaguers and and Cuban leaguers from the dead ball era. Uh, specifically, there's there's one portrait. Uh, in the book of uh, of Rube Foster, uh, that I that I really love, uh, I think when most people who know who Rube Foster is, you know, when they think about him, they kind of think of this this very you know Visionary. overweight man yeah. who's you know physically kind of imposing, wearing a suit, looking you know incredibly dapper, and being like you know the mogul of the Negro leagues. Sure. But uh, I think that a lot of people don't know that he was also one of the best uh, pitchers in the independent black leagues uh, back in the early 1900s. So there's this image of him with uh, the Chicago union giants from 1902, which is uh, only, I think a couple of years after he, uh, uh, after he uh, turned professional and he's, I mean, he's still kind of a big guy, but he, it's not the same Rube that we know. Yeah. You know, he, he looks like an athlete. Like he looks, he looks he's like, like a young big group in terms of yeah, you know, life. interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah, and there's just there's something. You know, it, it's one of those, it's one of those things that's hard to artic uh, to articulate. There's something in that image. I don't know if it's like pathos or something, but I was always I was always really drawn to it, and I, I just I thought that. It, it translated well into, you know, into the painting. And I, I just love the idea of, you know, celebrating Rube Foster, not only as the mogul, but also as this great uh, pitcher. That's fantastic. Jay, Jay, I'm going to ask you the same question. Well, I, I had uh, two um, uh, that I always come back to. Uh, the first is uh, Oliver, the ghost Marcel. Oh, um, the great picture of him with the, uh, 1923-24 uh, Santa Clara Leopards or Leopardos uh, de Santa Clara. 
love the uniform. Uh, Ghost Marcel to me is one of those, um, what I want to call mystery players. Um, uh, by reputation, he was a hard drinker, violent, womanizing, somebody you would never want as a neighbor. But he was a phenomenal baseball player. And the thing that always strikes me is that as the Negro Leagues wound down, the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the leading black newspapers, conducted a poll of um, 35 executives, players, and uh, black sports writers as to who are the all-time all-star um, uh, players at each position. Ghost Marcel won at third base in front of three guys that are in the Hall of Fame, Ray wow. Dandridge, Judy Johnson, and uh, Judd Wilson. Wow. And um, not only did he win, he won with over 50% of the votes and only uh, Oscar Charlson, uh, in terms of position players, won actually a greater percentage of the votes. So why isn't Ghost Marcel in the Hall of Fame? And he's certainly not going to get there because of his friends, because he didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg's saying, yeah, that's like you. That's like you. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I, me either. But... <laughs> so th that portrait always, I mean, he's, he was a handsome guy, just had a really interesting face. Um, and, and what happened to that uniform. face? <laughs> the other one that I always come back to is Home Run Johnson. Uh, Home Run again, Johnson. Not in the Hall of Fame, but uh, we have two portraits of him in the book, and one of them is with the uh, Cuban X Giants with the, the high collar and the uh, old English lettering on, oh, his, yeah. you know, on his jersey. I just love that image. That's Jay, can can you mention, because uh, you, you almost went all the way with, with Ghost Marcel, you mentioned that you know he had a very handsome face, but what happened to that face? Which oh. I I find the most interesting because I'm a terrible person. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, going to my earlier point, um, <laughs> he was in a gambling uh, game oh. with a teammate and um, got in a dispute over a bet. Apparently, that uh, Frank Warfield owed him uh, five dollars. Well, they got into a fight, and Frank uh, Warfield bit off a portion of his nose. His nose. <laughs> of his nose. And so um, he was near the end of his career anyway. But uh, that certainly hastened it because he was a handsome man. He had to go around wearing basically an eye patch over his nose and was just taunted brutally by people. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm sure he uh, took that well. Yeah, he took that well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, oh. One one other thing I do want to mention about the Ghost Marcel is when he did retire, he moved to Denver and had menial jobs like being a janitor and so forth. But um, Denver was the location of the uh, Denver Post Tournament, which at the time was considered the second most prestigious baseball tournament in the country after the World Series. The World Series kind of a, sure. is a tournament, right? Um he convinced the um, organizers of the Denver Post Tournament to invite the Kansas City Monarchs, um, which made it the first integrated uh, tournament. And then um, uh, the House of David, who came that year as oh, well, yeah. um, brought along Satchel Paige and his favorite catcher, uh, uh, Bill Perkins. And the House of David defeated the Kansas City Monarchs in the championship game. And it's actually that tournament that started Satchel Paige on his road to, fan, uh, to fame. That's really interesting. I did not. We know all owe it Ghost Marcel. Oh, Ghost Marcel. <laughs> He's the man. Poor noseless man. <laughs> But um, you know, I mean, we're we're kind of getting up against the against the time here. So I wanted to um you know, get a couple final thoughts from you guys. Um, you know, I mean, just open ended. You know, I mean, what you what do you what do you think, and what do you want people to get out of this book and out of this project? Knowing how much you put into it, um, how much time, how much love that you guys put into it, what do you hope people? What do you, really? I mean, like, what, how do you hope it affects people in a positive way, Greg? I thought you didn't see that one coming. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, that uh, wasn't on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that one up. Uh, I mean, honestly, I 
I just want people to, you know, in addition to obviously enjoy the book, I, I would like them to kind of, you know, gain an appreciation for these players, uh, these men and women who kind of laid the groundwork for uh, the game that we have today. Uh, and to just kind of, you know, recognize that, uh, that in this country, uh, and I guess in a lot of countries, that, uh, uh, you know, there is a history of, of racial conflict and how it kind of affected, you know, everything. Uh, and just kind of becoming aware of that, you know, on a, on a level that involves baseball, I, I think for me that that's kind of an important part. Uh, and obviously, you know, I, I want whoever reads it to, to like the pretty paintings. Hopefully they're pretty. <laughs> but that, sure that's, yeah. <laughs> Oh my Lord. My Lord. Jay, same question for you. Final thought on this. What, you know, what are you hoping that this project sparks in people? Well, I think, uh, I guess a couple things. One is an appreciation for the skills of these players that, sure. uh, they're brought out of the shadows. But the other thing that I, uh, one other thing I think is um, uh, how these players persevered. To me, that is, along with ability is the defining characteristic of the Negro Leagues. They didn't take no for an answer regarding integration. They kept on pressing. They tried, they failed. Okay, we'll try this path. Failed. Okay, we're going to try this path. Failed and kept on going. And the perseverance, I think, was uh, just a defining characteristic of these players. Um, another aspect is how this just ties in with overall American history. A lot of these players um, were just baseball players, but many of them were also civil rights pioneers. And they were actively involved in various civil rights issues of their time, which um, were very significant to them. And um, I think uh, you, you think about it, these players uh, opened the door for Jackie Robinson, a lot of them. And Jackie Robinson, you know, when he broke into Major League Baseball, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was a uh, junior in college. Hmm. Nobody had heard of him. You know, it was before the 50s yeah. civil rights struggles of, you know, Rosa Parks and, you know, Brown versus Board of Education and so forth. A lot of that actually opened up with baseball. Yeah, well, that's very, very true. And you know, I mean, I, I once again, I mean, I, I'm really, really glad that you guys came on, and I'm glad you guys reached out because I mean, this is something that, you know, I mean, I really believe people are going to love. I mean, I loved what I've read so far, and obviously, I love the artwork. Um, so, I mean, I think people are really, really going to take to this, and I think you guys did a hell of a job, and it's a, it's a, it's going to be a wonderful book, and I really wish you guys all the success in the world with it. Thank you. Um, so, you know, once again, thank you for coming on. Actually, you know what? Right before we leave, I, I, I this is something I've never been able to ask anybody. Jay, you, I read somewhere you got a kind of a quick hitting lesson from Ty Cobb. Oh, <laughs> I have to ask. I mean, I don't know anybody that's done that. Come on, I just Boy, what did you that? really quick before we go. Uh, I, I do a little research, believe it or not, myself. You know. Well, no, I, I was um, boy, I was you know like six, seven years old, maybe eight, and we lived just outside of Cooperstown. Yeah, and Ty Cobb was there uh, for one of the Hall of Fame weekends, and at that point. The crowds weren't big. I mean, Copperstown was a hard place to get to back in those days. Oh, yeah. And um, we just saw him walking down the street. And my dad, I had no idea who he was. My dad asked, uh, um, you told me, you know, that's a baseball player. Why don't you go up and uh, see if you can get this ball signed? And I did. And he, he actually talked to me. And he said, well, you know, <laughs> tell me how you hold the bat. And, and I tried to show him and, you know, he gave me a tip. Didn't take, otherwise you'd be uh, reading. <laughs> you'd be on a different show right now. I'd be on a different show for a different reason. Yeah, yeah. very true. That's, that's fantastic. I just, I just, I read that and I had to ask you in person about that because that's fantastic. But um, guys, again, I want to thank you guys for coming on. Um, again, the the book is called Black Baseball in Living Color. Uh, it's due out this month, and like I said, I mean, it's something something you're not going to want to 
want to miss and it's something you're going to love and uh if you love baseball or not it's something you're going to really enjoy so i want to thank jay caldwell greg kreinler for joining us here on tuesdays with leroy i'm chris vitale and we will catch you very soon thank you fellas Chris, thank, thank you. you really enjoyed it